All right. Okay. So before we get started, we're going to do the class for the Rafua Shalema, the complete recovery of Miriam Devorah Bas, Nahama Braina, and the Rafua Shalema of Rafael Naftali Ben Chana Tzivia, um, and in memory of uh, Sherry's father, Shaltiel Yoel Ben Moshe Yehuda, and Lily's mother, Miriam Bat Mordechai, and um, all of the um, all of the all of our brothers and sisters in Eretz Israel who are being um, bombarded and attacked, um, may Hashem save us all and protect us all um, with them through the merit of our learning. Any other names that we can mention before we start? Okay. Okay. All right, ladies. So we are in chapter four, still in chapter four, we are still in the discussion of the areas in which we have to have trust in God or how to, how to better set, let me just say it better. The areas in our, this different areas in our life, um, in which trust in God would apply and how to apply them. Uh, hold on. I have to let people in one second. One second. Uh, one second. Do, 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 do. I don't know why tech is again failing me here. Participants. Okay, admit. Okay, beautiful. Okay, Connie's here. One second, guys. I need to assist on a recipe. Let me stop. The yeah, I know. Super cute. <laughs> super, super cute. And those guys love those cookies. Let me tell you. Okay. <laughs> so just to get us back on track, we are, as I was saying, in the middle of chapter four, and we're about to start um, this the discussion on how um, trust applies when with regards to mitzvahs that, that we do alone right? But before we get to that, let's do a recap again. So far in chapter four, we have discussed the way trust applies in regards to um, me, myself, and I, my, my needs, my existence, my only thing, only my, 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 my existence, right? My being here, right? Um, and we said, obviously that flat out, we have to trust because God takes care of all of that from beginning to end. And we also said that we shouldn't rely on miracles, right? We can't say, well, since God is going to take care of everything from beginning to end, then I could just, you know, um, eat all the junk food in the world and, you know, just, and don't exercise and, you know, God will take care of my health. Well, it doesn't really work that way. We can't rely on a miracle. We can't be reckless. We can't be negligent, negligent. We actually have to be responsible. Um, then we talked about how, how to apply trust with regards to, um, my money and my stuff. Right. Um, and we talked about the fact that God, um, God provides all these things. However, the author warned us that, we could, God forbid, fall into the trap, the test, of, be challenged with the test of wealth, and we could fall into four different traps. We could either become hoarders because we might um, come to believe that the money is for me to keep and hoard. And there's, the, you know, if I don't keep it all now, I might not have anymore and I should not share it with other people because, um, you know, it's, it's all mine. Or we could become, we could fall into the trap of gangstering, which refers to behaving unethically um, be and taking shortcuts um, because, um, you know, now money's coming to me. So why don't I just cut a few corners so I can make more and, you know, be easier. But again, if I would trust and I, I would realize that the money is coming from Hashem and only from Hashem and the, I don't have to do any un anything unethical to get it. I would just do everything kosher and ethical and just get the same amount of money and be much more at ease and tranquil, right? It kind of reminds us of that alchemist that we met at the beginning, beginning of the book, right? When we talked about the fact that a person who has trust, um, he is superior to the alchemist, i.e. the man or the woman who can print money, basically, who can just with his alchemy, with his chemical 
um, his chemistry, he can create gold. Um, so this alchemist was in constant worry and fear, even though they had the, all the gold in the, in the world. And we went through all the 10 ways in which he actually um, was uh, inferior to a person of trust. So it kind of reminds us of that idea, right? Um, and then we have the challenge or the you know, the pitfall of shaming that we might come to have this extra money and feel that we have to shame others and we have to ask them to beg us for money or, you know, we would put them down, et cetera. We would feel um, superior or we could fall, excuse me, into the trap of seeking honor, right? Um, and, and you know, feeling like um, we need to you know, we need to have prestige and honor and all that. So the author warns us of that. And then we come into the, um, the application of trust when it comes to things to when it comes to the area of my, my family, friends and enemies, right, the people around me, the people who I interact with. And we talked about the fact that there are two possibilities in life with regards to other to interpersonal relationships, we could either be all alone, or could or we could not be alone. And if we're all alone, the author kind of gives us the the mindset to have to apply trust in our lives and understand that perhaps there are some real benefits. Um, there is good in the fact that I've been placed in such a situation and it might be comparable to the life of the prophets or the life of the ascetics or people who, who were in that situation in order to um, pursue, I guess, their spiritual endeavors um, in a more um, emphatic way, so to speak, right? And then we talked about the fact that, you know, there are some challenges to having a, a communal life, to relating to others, right? It's not necessarily so easy. So if we've been put in that situation, so there might be a benefit for us because we don't have to deal with those challenges. Now, if we are in the other situation where we do have a community, meaning we have people around us, we have children, we have a spouse, we have friends, um, people who we might not relate to, right? He calls them the, our enemies, right? So in this regard, um, when I have to live with other people, then I have to be loyal, right? I have to take my responsibility towards these people um, seriously. And I have to be a dedicated, you know, mother and friend and, you know, a community member and all the things. And I have to take care of all the people around me in a way that is um, wholeheartedly. I also have to have piety. I, I, you know, I have to teach people around me to serve Hashem. I have to, I have to be a role model and I have to instruct people on, you know, who, whom I'm in a role to instruct and everybody else who I'm not giving instruction. I still have to model how to serve Hashem. And I also have to do it in an altruistic way. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take on this role, right? If I've been given the role of having others in my life, then I'm also going to do all this without expecting any reward or any honor or any praise, etc. Okay. And so that was that. And then we talked about the enemies, right? In the, that same category um, with regard to the people that we have a relationship with. And regarding the enemies, we said that, um, that we have to keep in mind that, um, that we don't, we're not looking to, we have to keep in mind that everything that happens is from Hashem. Um, and that's the way we'd apply this mindset of trust, right? And not look to not, not allow these people to take such real, to take such, um, I guess, real estate space in our mind, right? That they become, God forbid, almost like an idol, right? Um, so we talked about this idea that in the end, we should um, repay them with kindness, so to speak. We should emulate Yosef with his brothers, right? And 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 really internalize the idea of that Yosef told his brothers, you know, it wasn't you, it was Hashem who sent me here. You didn't sell me. But Hashem wanted me here, right? Um, so understand that, you know, some people are going to come into our lives and they're not going to be perhaps the best around us, but we shouldn't be looking to destroy them. Of course, this is not to say we shouldn't have healthy boundaries and all the things that we've mentioned before. Okay. So that's the idea. Okay. That's, that's, we're up till that point. Now we're going to discuss a beautiful, beautiful concept. Um, and it's the idea of how do we trust with regard um, to mitzvahs, to commandments that we do 
alone and mitzvahs that we do with others. I don't know if we're going to get to mitzvahs that we do with others, but the idea is actually quite similar. Um, what we're going to learn here, actually, I find it really, really beautiful. Um, I, I don't think it's anything that, well, some of you, we've learned the book together before, so this will be a, a refresher, but I don't think it's anything that we've we've, we've, we've been taught this way or laid out like this as he lays it out. Um, I think it's, it's a beautiful idea and I'm going to summarize it now, and then we're going to read it inside the text. And then we'll, I guess we'll recap it again so that it sticks. Okay. So how do I trust, um, when it comes to the mitzvahs, the commandments that I do alone. And some of these commandments, some examples of these commandments are prayer, um, fasting, uh, Shaking lulav on esrog, um, avoiding um, transgressions, right? Chovos alevavos, duties of the heart, like like um, loving Hashem, fearing Hashem, knowing Hashem, right? These are all things that we do ourselves. They don't involve another person. So when it comes to these, when it comes to any goal in life, any goal, anything that you want to achieve, the author tells us there are three steps for you to accomplish anything. Step number one is you have to choose. We have to make a choice that we're going to do something, right? Then we have to plan it, right? How am I gonna execute this that I've chosen to do or to achieve? And then I have to complete it, right? Then I have to take the actions, the doing, the completion, okay? When it comes to material matters, when it comes to business, to the material world, the truth of the matter is, and again, it's a beautiful concept. He's going to contrast the, the material world and our spiritual, the, 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 the service of Hashem, okay, doing, doing mitzvahs. He's going to contrast it, and you're going to see it's actually a very beautiful concept. With regards to our mat materiality, our physicality, we're completely flying blind in the dark. We don't know what to choose. We don't know what's the best play, plan of action. And we have no clue if we're ever going to succeed. Okay? So we have to rely on Hashem for all three. I don't know who's the best partner for me in my life, right? Who's going to be the best father for my children? I don't know what's the best course of action to find this person, right? Do I go on website, dating sites? Do I, you know, put an announcement in my community board? Like, we don't know. And we don't know if we're going to succeed. We don't know in business what merchandise to buy, what conferences to go to, how to go about finding the right merchandise, what is the best price to find it out, who to sell it to, and if we're going to succeed. We literally don't know any of those things. So, we trust in Hashem for all of these. We choose a practical path given the information that we have in front of us, right? Okay, so there are some dating apps or friends who know, you know, people, right? Or, you know, whatever whatever the thing is, right? There's some merchandise that came my way. And I I, I find out from a few friends who've, who've embarked on that business and I kind of gather my data, right? I choose a practical path. I make sincere efforts, big, important concept that the author keeps going back to. And then I pray that Hashem blesses me with success, right? But I'm literally flying in the dark. Now, that is quite in contrast with our spiritual life. And again, this is a beautiful, beautiful concept, okay? When it comes to Torah and mitzvahs, I don't have to figure out the choosing or the planning. I don't have to figure that out, right? God has already revealed it to me, meaning I actually cannot trust in God for those two things, right? Unlike with material things, I have absolutely no clue. I literally have to trust in God that he puts the right merchandise in front of me and that he put, he like, that he gives me the right something because I have no idea what to do. When it comes to spiritual, my spiritual life, God doesn't have, to, I don't have to trust in God because God already told me what to choose and how to go about doing it.
So when it comes to choosing and planning, remember there's three steps to achieve anything in life. There's the choosing, the planning, and then the execute, the execution, the completion. Okay. The completion, com completing is a better word in this case, because otherwise it's going to get confusing with what it says in the book. Okay. So choosing, planning, completing, when it comes to choosing and planning, we don't rely on God in God because he already told us exactly what to choose. He says, choose the path of, to path of Torah. Here's, here's, here's a manuscript. Here's a blueprint. Okay. He gave us, he told us what to choose. And then he gave us the exact how to, he gave us a code of Jewish law that says exactly what the game plan is, how to go about fulfilling those mitzvahs. Okay. So I don't need to rely on Hashem, but when it comes to the third one, to the completion, then that's the one area that I actually have to rely because it is now in his hands. So whether I, let's say a person, let's say, let's take the example of Shabbos. Okay. So I can't say, I'm just going to trust Hashem that one day he'll inspire me. And yeah, may, may he'll, he'll let me know like when's the right time for me to keep Shabbos. Yeah. I, I heard about that thing called Shabbos and like Hashem, Hashem, Hashem will tell me when to do it. Right? No, I, no. Hashem already told us that that's what we have to do. He told us how to do it. Right? So I have to choose it. I have to plan it, right? I have to plan, oh, well, that's going to mean that I'm going to talk to my employer and I'm going to let him know. And I'm going to plan before I leave to work that morning. I'm going to have the food ready and I'm going to set the table and I'm going to plan with my coworkers that I'm not going to be available after three o'clock in the afternoon, let's say a blah, 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 right? And then I'm going to get in my car at 3.05. I'm going to go down in the elevator. I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to leave. Now, whether I actually, God, make it home, and light that those candles on time, and I succeed in, in completing that which I chose and I planned, that is up to Hashem, right? I, I think I, 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 I knew what to do. I knew what to, I knew what to choose because God told me, right? I knew how to do it because God told me, right? And then whether I, and I took the steps, right? I made the, I made the effort, whether I complete it or not, that's up to Hashem. But when it comes again to materiality, I totally don't know, right? We think we know what's the best business deal. No, the truth is we have no clue. We have no clue. We have to rely on Hashem completely that he guides us to find the right business partner, the right transaction, the right this, the, oh, 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 and I learned how to do it. And I sold it at the right price. Oh, and on top of that, I succeed. Oh, it's again, I have to trust in Hashem in all three areas. So it's a beautiful, beautiful concept. Let's now go inside the book and learn it inside and see exactly how he explains it. Okay. So we are going to be in page 163. Okay. So 163 at the bottom. The author now turns to discuss how a person is to have bitachon regarding matters of the fourth category, which are matters pertaining to Torah mitzvahs that only affect the person himself. So again, solo mitzvahs. The explanation of the proper manner in which the person has bitachon regarding the fourth category, which is again, solo mitzvahs, mitzvahs that I do alone, which is comprised of matters pertaining to the duties of the heart and the limbs of the person from which only the person himself gains or is harmed by them. So again, these are the things that only affect me. And he's going to give us examples. Examples are fasting, prayer, sukkah, lulav, tzitzis, observance of Shabbos and the festivals, refraining from committing transgressions and all the duties of the heart that do not pertain to anyone else and whose benefit or harm only affect him and no one else. Okay. So we're talking about solo mitzvahs, mitzvahs that I do by myself. I will explain the proper way in which to rely upon Hashem. May he be blessed regarding all of these matters. And I ask of God that in his mercy, he show me the truth in this matter. It is as follows. Acts of service of God and acts of transgression are only possible for a person to perform if the following three things come together. And again, we're going to reemphasize them several times because this is going to be the, the discussion all throughout 
for the, for, for, for the category number four and number five, this is going to come up again and again, choosing, planning, completing. So they are number one, the choice that he makes in his heart and mind. Number two, the mental decision to execute what he chose to do. And number three, the efforts that he makes with his visible limbs to complete the act, that act and bring it into the realm of action. So choosing to do something, planning it, and completing it, okay? The author will now make a distinction between the first two things about which a person should not have bitachon in God to help him with them, and the third thing for which bitachon is required. Regarding the parts of the above three things that are not hidden from us, meaning that it is in our power to control them, namely the choice that we make to either serve God or to transgress his will, and two, the mental decision to execute which again is what I'm calling planning, okay? Because execution in our in our modern use of the word really kind of feels like number three, which is completion. So the the it's it's the choosing, the planning, okay? Those are in our control. We do not rely on Hashem for them. And it would be a mistake and be foolish of us to rely on God for this. This is because the creator, may he be exalted, may he be blessed, has left us in control of the choice to either serve him or to rebel against him. As it is written, you shall choose life. So Hashem has told us what to do and Hashem has asked us to do it, but we get to choose whether we're going to do it or not. Okay. What is life? Obviously life is serving Hashem right? That's what gives us life. Life re re here refers to Torah observance. And in this verse, God tells us to choose life, right? It's a verse from Devarim, actually. Um, clearly, a person has free choice whether to observe the Torah or not. This being the case, it makes no sense to rely on God regarding this because it is completely in a person's control, right? You've been told, you've been told what the plan is and how to do it. You can't say, I'm going to rely on Hashem. You have choice. You have a choice to do it here or not. The ray is here. Beautiful. Okay. However, he did not leave us in control of executing the action to its completion, right? The completing, nope, that's up to God, be it an act of service of God or a transgression. Instead, it is dependent on external factors that are beyond our control. These factors are sometimes available and sometimes unavailable, right? I Like if we go back to the example of Shabbos, right? It is beyond our control if we're going to hit traffic and if we're, if some, you know, a hurricane is going to come, come in the middle, like all of these things are completely beyond our control, right? Therefore, it follows that with regard to the actual performance of the mitzvahs, which are dependent on external factors, the person should have bitachon that, that God will help him with the means with which to perform the mitzvahs and serve him. If a person in here, now he's going to, what is so wonderful about this book, you probably noticed by now, is that he, he uses all of the faulty logic that a person might have, and he's already like preempted it and he's con continuously debunking it okay so now he's about to do that he's about to show us the silly logic it is just in case you think like this let me tell you what this is wrong if a person relies on Hashem regarding his choice of divine service and he says to himself I will not choose or direct myself to perform any service of the creator until he chooses for me the best way in which to serve me, serve him. He has already strayed from the proper path and his feet have slipped from the correct way of serving Hashem. Why? He's going to tell us now. Okay. So basically don't, again, you, you can't say, oh, if God chooses for me, if God directs me for me to keep the, the mitzvahs, then I'll do them. I'll rely on God. He's going to tell me when, what, how. No, no, no. He already told you, right? Don't, don't, you can't do that. Why? For the creator, may he be blessed, has already commanded us to choose the performance of mitzvahs and to direct ourselves by making efforts and deciding to fulfill them wholeheartedly for the sake of his great name. And he let us know that this is the proper way for us to conduct ourselves to gain both in this world and in the world to come. So again, I just want to reemphasize, and you'll see as we go through this section, it is actually so beautiful. And if we look at it from the perspective of, oh my gosh, like, how, how great is the partnership that we're in? Like we have been empowered, 
right? To make a good choice for our life, right? This is literally like a partnership. Like God says, I need you in the world. I'm telling you how to best, how to be the best partner. Like, like, it's like if you go and work for a company, like a silly example, right? And they gave you the exact manual, how you're going to succeed in this endeavor, how you're going to actually be the best, you know, employee, right? The best, the best partner, the best person, like, right. People always say like, how do I advance in my role? Like, it's always kind of like a mystery. Like if I do like this, no, no, no. Like you're coming into this meeting and I'm going to give you the entire manual from beginning to end. I'm going to tell you exactly how to help me take this company to the next level. Boom. Imagine that. Imagine that. Well, that's exactly what's happening here, right? Hashem says, I need you. I want you. Let me give you all the tools so that you can succeed, right? Now go do it. And it's up to us, right? Now it's very empowering. Now nobody, he's not, he's not, he's not over us telling us, go do it, go do it, go. No, he, okay, he gave it to you. Now you go do it, right? We're independent, so to speak, right? Really aren't, but meaning we have free choice, right? We depend on Hashem to exist. Um, but we've given, we're given the free choice. Nobody's telling us he, God is not with a whip behind us, forcing us to do it. And we can't have the faulty logic of thinking, oh no, when God inspires me to do it, it'll tell us, no, 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 he's already told you, he's empowered you to do it. It's actually a very beautiful idea and, and something that we talk about to, with, with kids. This example that I just gave you about the company is actually a, a nice story that I always tell kids when they're turning, um, girls when they're turning their bas mitzvah, because that's exactly what happens, right? Now, God is literally calling you into his office and saying, here's Emmanuel, right? I need you. I want you. I want you to help me take this company to the next level. Here's exactly how you do it. Okay. So if this means that, if the, sorry, if the means that make it possible to perform the mitzvah are available to us and we're able to execute on our divine service after we choose to do it, then our reward will be great. We will receive reward for the following. Number one, for the choice to observe the mitzvah. Number two, for the resolve to execute it, right? The planning. And number three, for completion, for completing the act with our visible limbs. Okay, that's if everything goes according to plan, right? We plan to keep Shabbos and we succeed, right? Or we plan to keep kosher, right? We decide we're going to do it. We plan how to do it. We make a shopping list. We review the laws and we, we, right? We study with a friend and then we go to the supermarket and, and we find the meat and we find the chicken and we find everything and we're able to pay for it. And we put it in the car and it comes into our house and everything goes to plan. We put it in our mouth. Amazing. We kept kosher, right? Okay. So we get rewarded for all three. If, however, we come to the supermarket and there's a pandemic and there's no kosher food and all I have is fruits and vegetables. Well, okay, those are kosher. So great. So I kept kosher, but okay. But I didn't find the other things, right? I wasn't able to do the thing. Like I planned it, right? The whole thing, right? What happens then? Oh, let's see. If, however, the means with which to perform the mitzvah are withheld from us, then we will be still be rewarded for both the choice we made as well as the resolve to execute the planning, as we mentioned above in chapter three. And the same applies to the punishment for a sin. So let's read down below how it applies for a sin, because this is an important concept. When it comes to, um, when it comes to doing the opposite of a mitzvah, okay, so we just said that you're going to get reward for when you do a mitzvah, you're going to get, if you don't finish doing the mitzvah, you're going to get rewarded anyway for the choice and the planning. When it comes to a transgression, the, a person is actually um, liable for intending to sin only if he actually sinned. Okay. So we are never going to be punished for intent alone. However, we do get reward for intent alone. Okay, so this is a very good, important, I mean, it's, 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 he doesn't expound on it, but I just wanted to mention it, okay? So it's in the footnote here, okay? So we, we do get rewarded for, plan, for choosing and planning and executing, or if we don't finish executing or we don't finish completion, we still get rewarded for choosing and planning. When it comes to transgressions, we're not going to ever get uh, deducted points, let's say, or punished for having had the intent, 
right? Only if God forbid we actually complete, right? And fulfill and, and, and do the, the Avera. Okay, let's continue because that's kind of a side point. But now it gets, this is when the beauty of this start, starts come starts to come through is when we notice the difference between what we just explained and our material or mundane affairs. The author has explained the fundamental difference between bitachon regarding worldly matters, such as the person's livelihood, and bitachon when it comes to Torah observance. When it comes to worldly matters, the person might be obligated to make efforts to obtain his physical needs, but he relies wholly on God for his success. However, when it comes to spiritual matters, the, per the person should not rely on God to show him the proper path. The reason for this difference is as follows. So again, why the, di why the difference between both materiality, I'm completely blind. And I, when it comes to choosing, planning, and completing, I have to trust in Hashem. I have no idea if Hashem is going to put the right idea for business in my head, if he's going to put in, make, allow me to plan it properly and allow me to complete the business deal. No idea, right? I have to completely trust. I cannot trust myself. There's, I have no control over it. When it comes to mitzvahs, no. I cannot trust in Hashem for the choosing or the planning. I, I only trust for the completion. Why the difference? The reason why there's a difference between the way a person has trust in Hashem, may he be blessed regarding matters of his service of the creator and the way he has trust with regards to all or other worldly matters is as far as all other worldly matters are concerned, it has not been revealed to us which means are the best and most helpful to obtain our needs. Again, we're flying blind. Similarly, it has not been revealed to us, which means will cause us loss and bad fortune and which will not. For we don't know which type of work is best for us and which is the most proper means for us to use in pursuit of livelihood, health, and other needs that are for our benefit, right? We have to trust in Hashem that he's putting the right doctor in front of us. We have no idea. We have absolutely no idea. We have to trust that Hashem put the, 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 that my friend told me of this special doctor. And that was because Hashem wanted me to go to that doctor and he's going to be the best doctor for this thing that I need. But I have no control over that, right? I have to trust in Hashem. I have no idea. We also do not know which merchandise to buy, which journey to take, or which from or which from among the worldly actions we will be successful at when we engage in them. We have to engage them. We have to put effort. We have to try our best with the knowledge that we have in front of us, but we have no idea. Therefore, regarding worldly matters, it is proper that we rely on Hashem to help us choose the most appropriate means to engage in, as well as to help us complete the actions that are best for us. This is provided that we make efforts to engage in those means and that we pray to him that he waken our hearts to choose the means that are the best and most appropriate for us. So again, the author wants to reemphasize the idea that we have to put the effort, right? So again, I told you last week, I have a lot of friends who are uh, in Shidduchim trying to marry off their children, right? So again, they have no idea, right? But they have to try and they will call and say, look, you know, remember my son, here's what he's like. Do you, do you know any girls? Oh yeah. I actually had this idea from a friend of mine. I heard there's a girl in Miami that, da, 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 right. I have no idea. She has no idea. Nobody has any idea, right? We're just trying our best. We're hoping that Hashem is putting the, the, the pieces together in the right way, right? We have to trust in Hashem. No, we have no clue, right? But we're putting the effort. She's calling the friends. I'm calling the other friend, the other, right? We're putting the effort, right? We're trying our best. Here, the author reemphasizes that bitachon alone is insufficient and that the person must also make efforts in the natural order. The author continues by explaining that matters of Torah observance are different. So now, again, the difference. A person only needs to pray to God or rely on him to show him how to behave in those areas where God has not already done so, meaning material matters, only in those areas which he didn't show us, which is all the physical matters of our existence, but in the spiritual matters, he already showed us. So we don't need to rely on him. However, when it comes to the service of Hashem, he has already instructed us how to serve him. And he has told us that doing so is for our good. It therefore makes no sense to rely on God for this. 
However, this is not the case with the service of the creator. May he be blessed. This is because he already informed us of the proper ways in which to serve him, commanded us to choose them, and gave us the ability to do them. Therefore, if we were to pray to him that he guide us in our choices regarding this, or were we to rely on him to show us the best ways for us to serve him, we would be mistaken in our offering words of prayer to him, and we would be fools in our reliance on him. For he has already informed us of the ways in which to serve him, which will help us both in this world and in the world to come. So we do have to pray to Hashem that we succeed, right? We have to honestly want to serve Hashem. We have to honestly want to succeed in doing it, right? And we have to pray that he give us the strength, that right that we can do it and all the things right but but when it comes to at the end of the day we have to trust that he's going to give us the strength and the to, to finish to finish what we've decided to do okay so i'm going to skip the pasuk in the verses and i'm going to continue on page 171 an additional difference between torah matters and worldly matters and again this one is beautiful furthermore when it comes to material matters sometimes the means that appears to be good turns out to be bad and what appears to be bad turns out to be good. We can all think of things in the material world that it seemed like it was going to be good. It seemed like that was going to be the best job or the best career or the best business deal or the best partner, right? The best business partner, right? And it turns out to have been like a disaster. We, right? It turns out, but not only that, the timing, there are things that change over time. We think that's the best medical treatment, right? But medical treatments that were really good 50 years ago, right? Are completely outdated today and banned, right? There's things that we would never nowadays do. Or we can think of things like, didn't they used to think like smoking was healthy or something like people, even doctors smoke, right? We don't smoke nowadays. We know better, right? So these things change over time. They're not, they're very different from Torah truths, okay? So however, when it comes to the service of Hashem and transgressions of his commandments, it is not so, right? It, it's not so that things that seem to be good turn out to be bad and that what one day was good, tomorrow is going to be bad or vice versa, for those things that are either bad or good will never cease to be, nor will they change to be the opposite of what they were until now. Meaning the Torah is true. It's always going to be true from Aleph to Taf, from beginning to end. It is unchangeable. So when Hashem told us keeping kosher is what's good for your body and soul, that's never going to change. It's, 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 it's unchangeable, right? When Hashem told us not to work on the seventh day, that's unchangeable. It's always going to be good for you, right? But smoking, not smoking, doing this kind of medical treatment for this kind of disease, those change over time. This kind of business. Think of the types of businesses that we do today that 50 years ago would be, would be like... What, what would you say? Like they would be so frowned upon, for example, right? Or, like, or, or things that we wouldn't think of doing, right? Many, right? So, so it's again, these, when it comes to these material things, there are changes, there are fluctuations. But when it comes to Torah matters, um, that is not the case. So with material matters, sometimes what appears to be the right choice ends up being the wrong one. A person has no concrete method of knowing what the right choice is. Therefore, it is not. It is necessary to rely on Hashem to direct him towards the right choice. However, in spiritual matters, God has instructed us on the correct behavior, and that never changes. Okay, page 172. The aforementioned concept that bitachon does not apply to spiritual matters only refers to the two aspects of choice and decision, which here is like choice and planning in my, in my, the way I teach it. Okay. So bitachon does not apply to the first two with making the choice and planning to doing it. However, there is still an area of divine service regarding which bitachon is necessary, and that's going to be completion. Here we go. 
However, it is proper to trust in God when it comes to the ability to complete with success any act of his service after wholeheartedly and genuinely choosing to perform the mitzvahs, resolving to do so, and making efforts with a pure heart and with intent that it would be for the sake of his great name. So you plan on putting on the tefillin, you know how to put on the tefillin, you go and you show up and you are, whether you finish putting on the tefillin, you got to tr- you got to trust in god for that that he actually allows you the the merit to finish completing that mitzvah regarding the facet of observance this facet of observance namely that we be successful in the performance of mitzvahs we are obligated to pray to god to help and guide us okay so we need to trust in him for that and here i'm going to skip the pesukim and i'm going to go to page 174 and we are going to start uh, num- category number six, which is the commandments that affect other people. So right now the discussion was just in the commandments that are solo myself. And, and we, we, and he started framing it as no, that you have, you need three things in, to do anything in life, choosing, planning, completing, when it comes to choosing, planning, completing. Okay. First, to, when it comes to spiritual matters, you trust in Hashem only for completing because he's told you the choice, he's told you how to do it. When it comes to all the other things in life, material concerns, you got to trust in all three, choosing, planning, and completing. Now, how does it work with mitzvahs that I do with other people, like tzedakah, for example? Let's see. We will now discuss the explanation of how to have proper bitachon regarding the fifth category, namely the duties that a person performs with his limbs that benefit or harm other people. Examples are charity, separation of tithes, my sir, teaching Torah wisdom to other people, teaching other people proper conduct and warning them against bad behavior. Similarly, returning deposits and debts, keeping a secret, speaking good about another person, behaving kindly with a fellow, honoring parents, humbling the wicked so they return to the service of Hashem, advising people on what is good for them, having compassion for the poor people and being merciful towards people when they are in distress. All of these are mitzvahs that are, it takes two to tango, right? This also includes tolerating embarrassment by people when attempting to inspire them to divine service by informing them of the great reward that is due to people who perform God's will and by instilling in them the fear of punishment that is due to people who transgress God's will. So anything that involves other people, not just you, what is the proper way to have bitachon regarding these The person should have in his heart the intention to do all these acts and the like should the opportunity arise to do them. When the opportunity does arise, he should make the choice to do them again and pursue the means with which to do them, as already explained in the fourth category about the obligation to choose to observe the mitzvahs while having in mind the goal of drawing others close to Hashem and not with the goal of acquiring for himself a name or honor from the people with whom he is performing these mitzvahs. And he's referring to when we discuss mitzvahs regarding um, regarding my relationship with others, regarding um, my friend, my, my family, friends, and enemies, right? We talked about the fact that we have piety, we have loyalty, and we have altruism. We're not doing this. We're not engaging in these relationships to look for um, aggrandizement or honor, okay? So similarly, his intention in performing these mitzvahs should not be with the hope of their repaying him, nor should it be in order to rule over them, right? That would be completely arrogant, and that would be discounting Hashem. So obviously, that is not bitachon. After doing this, he should rely on Hashem regarding the completion of the act that he intended to do, which is in accordance with what God wants from him, provided that the person has made efforts to do so. Ideally, he should perform these mitzvahs in private in order to keep his intentions intentions as pure as possible. He should be as scrupulous as possible to conceal his actions from the people whom he does not need to inform, right? So it doesn't have to make a whole fanfare. When, for when the mitzvah is concealed from other people, his, re- his reward will be much greater than if his act were known. When a person fulfills mitzvahs in private, they are by default fewer ulterior motives, and therefore his reward will be greater. But what about the mitzvahs that for one reason or other or another cannot be fulfilled in private? How can he ensure that he will not get mirrored in ulterior motives? So the author is going to tell us. 
and whatever he's able to conceal, right? Sometimes we want to do something in private for whatever reason, it becomes public or you can't do it fully in private. So what happens then? He should remind himself of the principle mentioned above. No gain or harm can be caused by another created being without the explicit permission of the creator. May he be blessed. So again, we go back to fundamental principles in Bitachon that we learned earlier on, right? And if God doesn't want it to happen, it's not going to happen. Okay. So I just have to keep doing the mitzvah and I try my best to do it in private. And if it doesn't happen in private, then, you know, it's beyond my control. Since I mentioned above, since as mentioned above, when a person does a mitzvah in public, it is more difficult to harbor pure intentions. He must therefore remind himself that he will not get any more honor from the people based on his actions because no one truly has the ability to cause him benefit or harm unless decreed so by God. When the creator causes a mitzvah to be performed by him, he should think to himself that it is a kindness from the creator, may he be exalted, who was kind to him and gave him the opportunity to perform the mitzvah, right? He should really, so again, it goes back to that thing that we keep mentioning. It's the difference between living a me-centered life and a God-centered life. So if God allows me the opportunity to be in a situation where I'm going to perform a mitzvah that involves another person, right? Takes two to tango, right? The mindset is, well, number one, I need to do it. I tried to do it in private. And if it's not possible to be done in private, then I still have to understand that this is not about me. This is not about me getting honor, right? And when I, and, and if I actually, I, I'm able to fulfill this mitzvah, I'm able to complete it, right? I need to go back to who, to who, the one who allowed me to complete it, right? I have to thank Hashem for the kindness that he allowed me that through me, I was able to help this other individual in whatever the way it was, right? That he allowed me the opportunity to do this. He should not rejoice when people praise him for it, nor should he want people to honor him due to his good deed, right? It's like when somebody asks uh, somebody comes to us for a donation for something, right? Really, we, we have to thank them. They don't need to thank us, right? We who can write the check need to thank them for giving us the opportunity, right? To be in a position to help right? For being, giving us the opportunity to actually help. And we have to thank Hashem that we're actually helping that person. So it's a, it's a, it's a complete flip, right? So when the person who's asking you for tzedakah says, thank you very much. No, 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 not, don't thank me. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know that there's a need and thank you Hashem for allowing me that I could fulfill that request, that I could do it. Allowing me to fulfill it. For if he does so, it will, so meaning if he rejoices, if he rejoices uh, that people praise him and all the things, right? And he and he and he he gets honored and all that. If he does so, it will cause him to become arrogant. What's arrogance? Forgetting Hashem, leaving Hashem out of the picture, to become arrogant about his good deeds and his purity of heart and intention for the sake of heaven. When performing the mitzvah, will be ruined. There's, there wasn't any purity of heart at the end of the day. The good deed itself will be ruined and he will lose his reward. I intend to explain this in the appropriate gate with the help of God. So he actually remember that, that this is only one gate, a number of gates. So there's another, there's another gate where he goes over this. Um, he says here on the note is the gate of wholehearted devotion of all acts. Um, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. It's the sixth gate, the gate of humility, which would be appropriate for this topic. Okay. So anyways, the author now turns to discuss how a person is to have bitachan regarding matters of the sixth category. So now we're going to enter the sixth category, which I actually don't want to start because then it's going to confuse us. And the sixth category is attaining is attaining the world to come. So what I want to do right now is go over one 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 a, a few ideas that we just did regarding the the two to tango mitzvahs. Okay, so I just want to review that part in the last few minutes. Okay, how do I trust in God regarding those mitzvahs that I do with other people? There are going to be six guidelines here. Okay, that we just went over, but I'm I'm giving it to you like broken down. He didn't tell us there are there are six guidelines, but I'm telling you the breakdown. Okay, so following 
three steps, the three steps that he already told us, okay, choosing, planning, doing, okay, drawing others close, um, avoiding honor, concealing the deeds, we said to, to do it in private, be fearless, yes, yet modest and thanking Hashem. So let me go over this because it's going to help you understand what we just did. Okay. So after I've done number one and number two, meaning the choosing and the planning, I rely exclusively on Hashem for the doing, completing the mitzvah that I intend to do that is in accordance to what God wants for me. So this is exactly in the same way as with mitzvahs that I do alone, with mitzvahs that I do with others. When it comes to the choosing and the planning, I do not trust in Hashem. Hashem told me exactly what to do. He told me exactly that I, how to give charity. He told me exactly how to speak to another human being, right? Words of kindness, right? Or what not to say, right? When it comes to the doing the completion, I have to rely on Hashem, okay? What is my goal? My goal is to draw others close to Hashem, right? My goal is to be an ambassador of Hashem in the world, right? And with that, I'm going to draw other people close to Hashem. I have to be a lamplighter. That should be my ultimate goal. This is not about me. Remember I told you, this is all about that beautiful partnership. This is not about me. This is about how do we take the mission to the next level? How do I take the company to the best, right? How do I, how do I take the world as it is, right? And make it even better. Oh my gosh, I've been invited to be part of that. Yes. So part of that is, okay, so now I'm going to make a Kiddush Hashem. I'm going to go represent Hashem in this world, right? And the third element here in doing mitzvahs with others that relate that, that are two to takes two to tango is, so number one, following the three steps, uh, choosing, planning, doing, and knowing that bitachon only applies in the doing or completing, um, drawing others close to Hashem or being a Kiddush Hashem, avoiding honor, okay? The goal is not to make a name for myself, not to rule over others. Number four, concealing my good deeds, meaning staying, be, being private. Okay. I, I, I try to be private about it. There's no, there's no need to be all public. Again, if, if it becomes public for whatever reason, okay, fine. But that, that I, sh my intent should be, shouldn't be publicity. It should be serving Hashem. It should be bringing Hashem's honor to the world. Right. And then number five is being fearless of those who mock me right? And also modest if people praise me. So again, knowing, knowing, knowing who, where I stand, right? I'm a representative of Hashem. So if somebody mocks me, I, I could be, I could stand up straight because I know who I'm representing, who sent me here. And if they praise me, I also don't, I don't have to blow up because I know who I'm representing. It's not me. I'm just representing the king, right? And the last one, the sixth one is I have to thank Hashem, right? When a God causes that a mitzvah is completed through me, I thank Hashem for his kindness because he gave me the opportunity to help others. The reward of the mitzvah at the end of the day, as it says, is the mitzvah itself. Um, and so I thank Hashem that he allowed me to do it. So that is up to where we are now. Next week, then we're going to go into how do how does trust apply? How do we apply trust with regard to our reward and the world to come, which is a little bit of a, um, a more amorphous topic because we're not, you know, it's hard for us to talk about the world to come, but the, the author does discuss it. So the next two points are going to be about a reward in the world to come and then extra things that we might even do to earn the world to come. But so far, I hope this, um, I found this section of the book actually really, like I told you, really beautiful and empowering. Um, and let's hear any comments, any questions. Sherry, I'm very glad that you made it because I saw your text in the middle of class that you were at a dinner. So welcome. <laughs> and everybody else who is here, welcome. And also we have, I think we have some newcomers. Um, okay. So questions, comments, any stories? I have a question. Yes. Okay. So, you know, you're supposed to conceal your good deeds, but when it comes to donations, I always feel like it can inspire another to do exactly. it. If they see, Oh, yeah. Elle made a donation right. to so-and-so I should do it too. Correct. That is a very, very good point. And that's something that the, the Rebbe brought out many times. And I even think the Alter Rebbe talks about it. And I'm sure it's it's talked about in many places. When it comes to tzedakah, obviously, it's better to do it in private. But if one knows that putting their name there is going to affect others, influence others, 
then again, because of that, one should put their name. So mm-hmm. it's always, I even have a very good friend who's a very big philanthropist and trust me, he is like the most humble person, unassuming person. He doesn't want any honors, but I, I've heard it from him himself said, okay, it's, if it's going to help that other people, because again, if they see that George put money, how could I not put money? Right. That's the way it works. So that it, what you're saying is absolutely true. And it is the correct thinking. If you know that it's going to influence others positively, because there's also, by the way, a mitzvah for us to uh, to cause others to give charity, right? Not right. just for us to give charity, but to f- to allow others to do it, to bring others into the charitable giving. So yes, so if 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 it's if you say, hey, Yael, I gave to this thing, I think you would love doing this. You're not bragging. You're just saying, oh wow, yeah, Sherry did it. Yeah, wow, Sherry's right. I should totally get on board with this, right? So yes, okay. Good question, Sherry. Any other comments, ideas, thoughts, stories? Are we good? Okay, amazing. All right, so I will um, send out the replay for those who weren't here live and for everybody else also. And I will see you. Have a good Shabbos and I will see you all next week. Shabbos. Bye-bye. Thank you for coming. Great to see you. Thank you.